Hello everyone, and welcome to Episode 8, Remastered. Last episode, I introduced the cell as the fundamental building block of living things. I discussed the qualities that eukaryotes and prokaryotes share, and the things that make them different. In this episode, I'm going to dig deeper into cell physiology by exploring the internal subsystems and the structures of the cell. In terms of cellular physiology, you can think of this episode kind of like a part two to episode seven's part one. So if you haven't listened to it yet, I suggest that you do so before listening to this one. In episode seven, I talked about the cytoskeleton that prokaryotes and eukaryotes have in common. In this episode, I'll talk more about the cytoskeleton, including the molecular structure of its fibers and the functions that they do for the cell. I talked about the endoplasmic reticulum and how it produces proteins and lipids, and how it interacts with the Golgi complex. In this episode, I'll explore how these organelles interact and communicate on a molecular level, and how they organize and distribute specific proteins or lipids to the right places. In episode 7, I briefly discussed the nuclear envelope, and in this episode, I'll discuss the nuclear pore complex that regulates the passage of particles into and out of the nucleus. So as I discuss all of this physiology, Try to visualize how these systems interact simultaneously to allow the cell to stay alive and functional. Perhaps the easiest way for a cell to stay alive and functional is to have a stable, open compartment in which all of its biochemistry can go along undisturbed. The phospholipid bilayer membrane does a good job at regulating the passage of particles into and out of the cell, but it lacks a certain consistency. The phospholipids in the bilayer aren't actually connected to one another. They just float side by side in response to hydrophobic interactions with water. The phospholipids shuffle along together if the cell is moving, but the phospholipids themselves can't really move in a coordinated, deliberate way. More importantly, they can't work together to move the cell in a coordinated, deliberate way. The cytoskeleton, however, can do all of this. So what is a cytoskeleton? In episode 7, I briefly touched on the cytoskeleton, describing it as a series of thin filaments and tubes layered across the inside of the membrane. Now this is true, but it's a pretty simple explanation. The cytoskeleton does a whole lot more. The fibers crisscross the cytoplasm in a flexible network that stabilizes the cell and organizes the mechanical relationship between organelles. As a whole, the cytoskeleton provides the consistency that the fluid bilayer doesn't have. In concert with the phospholipid bilayer, the cytoskeleton allows the cell to exhibit a fantastic degree of plasticity. It can smoothly expand or contract in response to osmosis or in response to the density of nearby cells. It allows the cell to move and reorganize internal structures, which is especially important during cellular replication, when all of the internal structures are getting duplicated and divided between the new daughter cells. Together, the fibers of the cytoskeleton create a flexible meshwork that weaves throughout the insides of the cell, stabilizing it and enabling a dynamic integration between the cell's internal components. The cytoskeleton is composed of three distinct types of fibers. Each fiber has a unique structural design that imparts various qualities into it. When numerous fibers layer together or mix with other fiber types, they can create large structures like sheets or webbing that has additional qualities for the cell. So from largest to smallest, these fibers are microtubules, intermediate filaments, and actin filaments. Microtubules are large coiling polymers composed of dimer monomers, or molecules composed of two separate subunits bound together. In the case of microtubules, the monomer dimers are composed of two proteins called alpha and beta tubulin. These dimers are polar molecules. They possess both a negative and a positive end. And so when they align in their tens and hundreds to form a polymer, they organize according to their polarity, which is kind of like amino acids and proteins. Because opposites attract, each monomer aligns itself in the same repeating orientation relative to the others with the positive ends all pointing in one direction along the chain and the negative ends all pointing in the opposite direction along the chain. One end of the polymer is therefore going to hold a negative polarity. It's going to be the negative terminus, while the other end is the positive terminus. It has a positive polarity. 
Positive end has a free beta tubulin. So the beta tubulin monomer in the dimer is the positively charged little monomer. With this information, you can deduce that the alpha tubulin protein has a high concentration of amino acids with negatively charged polar side chains. Similarly, you can also deduce that the beta tubulin protein has a very high concentration of amino acids with positively charged or positive polar side chains. Due to the electronegative interactions with ATP, the positive end of the microtubule will actually grow faster than the negative end. In order for the microtubule polymer to grow, a molecule of ATP must bind to a free monomer. This complex then binds to the end of the polymer using the energy in the ATP to form the bond. When the polymer is degraded, this ATP is consumed in a hydrolysis reaction to form ADP and an inorganic phosphate ion. In all species, microtubules originate from a particular molecule or a group of molecules known generally as a microtubule organizing center, or an MTOC. The MTOC holds the negative ends of the microtubule, which allows the positive end to grow outwards into the depths of the cell. Each MTOC is swamped in a cloud of proteins involved in the synthesis of microtubule fibers. Plants, for example, can have hundreds of these MTOCs throughout their cells, but animal and fungal cells typically have just one microtubule organizing center. In the animal cell, the MTOC is called the centrosome, as it's the center of the radiating microtubule fibers that reach out into the cell. The centrosome assists in cellular replication by reaching out with microtubules to the numerous pairs of replicated chromosomes. The microtubules then anchor themselves to the chromosomes to that little central point that holds them together, and then the centrosomes start to retract, which pulls the chromosomes apart towards opposite ends of the cell. This is a critical step in cellular division. If one daughter cell doesn't get its DNA, if it doesn't pull the right amount of uh, chromosomes to its side, it can't really grow or reproduce or do anything besides briefly take up resources and then die. The animal centrosome is composed of two identical structures oriented at 90 degrees to one another. These structures are called centrioles, and they're a tube composed of tubulin trimers arranged with their long axes parallel to one another and their short axes radiating outwards from the ring. These centrioles were once thought to be required for microtubule synthesis, although recent experiments have shown that this may not be the case. At any rate, the centrioles are involved in organizing this radial growth of microtubules. These microtubules are critically important for the transport of cargo-laden vesicles throughout the cell. Kinesin molecules use the microtubules like highways or roads to drag vesicles wherever they have to go. Kinesin is a motor protein. It's a special class of protein that can consume ATP to induce a forceful movement. The kinesin molecule has a head, a neck, and a tail region. And the tail region can anchor to a membrane, like a vesicle. The neck connects the tail to the head, and the head has two globular structures that are kind of like feet. By consuming a molecule of ATP through a hydrolysis reaction, the kinesis molecule can undergo a conformational change in the head region, which effectively makes it take a single step. Eat another ATP molecule, take another step. Another ATP, another step. The feet of the kinesin molecule bind to the microtubule, and each ATP hydrolysis reaction makes the kinesin take one more step down the microtubule road, heading from the negative end of the microtubule to the positive end. Another motor protein called dynin can walk along microtubules in the opposite direction, from the positive end to the negative end. However, I'll discuss the dynin protein in more detail in a few minutes. Binding to a molecule of ATP causes the first conformational change in kinesin, which initiates the step. The release of ADP as a product of the hydrolysis reaction will then create another conformational change, which completes the step. The kinesin molecule can take up to 375 steps in a single second, although the speed that it moves at varies on the need. Due to their function as roads used by the vesicle-dragging kinesin proteins, the microtubules are incredibly important for the proper functioning of the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi complex. 
The rough ER is responsible for synthesizing proteins, while the smooth ER processes lipids. These two regions of the ER each send their products to the Golgi apparatus to be sorted and labeled for transport. Microtubules are used as the road tracks for the transport of these vesicles. At the Golgi apparatus, proteins and lipids are organized according to where they need to go in the cell, what they need to do, and so they get repackaged into another vesicle. The Golgi apparatus uses the microtubules to send its vesicles to the right destinations. Now, two important cellular features that I can't skip are the cilia and the flagella. Both of these are a type of whip-like structure composed of microtubules that can induce forceful movement by rapidly wiggling and waving back and forth. Flagella are generally large ropes of microtubules extending out of the sides of the cell. In prokaryotic cells, the flagella is shaped like a helix, or a screw, and when it rotates, it propels the cell along like a rotor on a boat. In eukaryotic cells, the flagellum waves back and forth, like the tail of a fish to beat its way through the water. Consider the human sperm cell, a haploid germ cell with a characteristic flagellum that it waves back and forth to surge forward in powerful bursts of movement. Now, where the flagella is large and powerful, the cilia are small and weak. This difference in size is made up for in number and distribution. Where one cell can usually have one, two, or maybe even four flagella, another cell can be covered in hundreds or thousands of cilia. The cilia are like little hairs, able to wave and pulse in rhythmic coordination with other cilia. Cilia on the outside of the cell can propel the cell through water. Cilia on the inside of the cell can induce directed currents in the cytoplasm. The stem, or the stalk of a cilium or a flagellum strand, is called the axoneme. If you were to cut the axoneme in half and look at the cross-section, you would see that the internal structure has a ring surrounded by two points, with what looks like spokes from a bike tire connecting them. All of these structures are composed of microtubules and they give the axoneme a certain stiffness and stability. So how does the cilia wiggle rhythmically to the pulse of the cell? How does the flagella wave around to push the cell? This action is the result of a protein called dynin. Because of all the bonds and linkages that are stabilizing the microtubules, they cannot be easily pushed or pulled around by protein motors. The effective range of movement is heavily constrained as the movement of one microtubule pair will tug on or move all of the nearby pairs. So the dynin motor protein will undergo a conformational change, and it will apply force to the microtubules. Because of the structural constraints, the microtubules can't just slide alongside one another or pull themselves closer together. So instead, the dynin will contort the microtubules and cause them to bend. When the dynin proteins on each side of a flagella are activated alternatively, it produces a back-and-forth waving motion. One side is activated, the proteins flex and the microtubule bends one way. The other side is activated, those proteins flex, and the microtubule bends the other way. If you're a little microbe and you do this over and over again, you basically have a long waving paddle that's giving you enough momentum to scoot around the little mud puddle that you call home. Now, the second type of cytoskeletal fiber is called the intermediate filament. Intermediate filaments are nonpolar molecules used exclusively for various structural purposes within the cell. Intermediate filaments come in a large variety of different types, depending both on the species and the type of cell. These polymers can have many different kinds of monomers, specialized for whatever purpose that that particular cell has. Your skin cells, for example, have 20 different types of keratin filaments in them. Your fingernails, your toenails, and your hair all have different types of keratin concentrations being secreted by your cells. Within your cells, intermediate filaments provide structural support and protection against mechanical damage like scrapes and strikes. They line the membrane of the cell to give it a degree of stability and rigidity. A type of intermediate filament called the nuclear lamin does the same thing for the nuclear envelope, giving structural support to the double membrane of the nucleus. The nuclear lamins help the nucleus keep its shape 
by forming dense sheets, just like keratin and carbohydrates like cellulose and chitin. The nuclear lamins also play a role in the dissolution and the reconstitution of the nuclear envelope during cellular replication, presumably working to hold on to a few phospholipids to act as sites of membrane regeneration. These filaments also anchor the chromosome molecules to various points on the inside of the nuclear envelope, and this helps keep the chromosomes from getting disordered and tangled up, which would impair cellular replication and proper DNA expression. Intermediate filaments also extend from the nucleus to connect to the filaments forming an inner layer on the membrane. These extending filaments anchor the nucleus in place within the cell. They hold it there in the cytoplasm in 3D space, and this just provides another degree of internal stability. The third types of fiber are actin filaments, also called microfilaments. These are very thin, 6 nanometer wide, dual polymer molecules composed of a protein called actin. Actin forms from subunits called G-actin, where G stands for globular. These subunits assemble into longer filaments of actin, unsurprisingly called F-actin or filamentous actin. The creation of an actin filament begins when three G-actin subunits spontaneously form a three-monomer chain called a trimer. Trimers connect together to create the longer F-actin filaments, which compile together into bundles or networks. Actin also possesses a polarity, with each molecule having a positively charged end and a negatively charged end. In groups, actin molecules organize themselves into a line, with the charged end of one molecule forming a non-covalent bond with the positively charged end of another molecule. In this way, actin proteins form a polymer of repeating monomers with a shared orientation. These non-covalent bonds make the actin filament a particularly unstable molecule. While it may seem like instability is not a quality that you would want in a structural protein, this instability is actually integral to the functional qualities of actin filaments. Each filament grows or shrinks depending on the concentration of G-actin subunits available. Much like microtubules, the positive end of the actin filament, or the barbed end, is able to grow much faster than the negative end, or the pointed end. The barbed end grows when it binds to a G-actin molecule bound to ATP. The ATP molecule is subsequently cleaved off in a hydrolysis reaction, where it returns to the cytoplasm to be used in other reactions. This all happens pretty quickly, whereas the polymer degradation at the negative end happens relatively slowly. G-actin on the negative end are slowly broken off and released into the cytoplasm. So now we have both ATP and G-actin monomers floating around in the cytoplasm. These can associate and bind to the positive end of the polymer. In this way, actin filaments have something called dynamic instability where it's in the core of it, it's stable, but on either ends, it's fraying and falling apart or rapidly building. And so there's this flow of monomers within the larger internal structure. It's kind of like a Theseus's ship of biomolecules. There's a specific protein called myosin that's associated with actin. The myosin protein is really interesting, and it serves a really important purpose. Like kinesin, Myosin is a motor protein, and it consumes ATP to produce a force or a specific movement. Myosin proteins have three distinct regions, called the head, neck, and tail. The head region consumes an ATP molecule in a hydrolysis reaction, creating an ADP and an inorganic phosphate. When the head region detaches from the ADP, its conformation rapidly changes. The head and the neck regions of the myosin protein are involved in a rapid and forceful conformational change, like a leg kicking out forcefully. The myosin head can bind to an actin filament. Each kick from the myosin head pulls the actin filament a little bit in one direction. Now your muscle cells are just packed with millions upon millions of myosin and actin molecules. They're all aligned in parallel along the direction of your muscles. So when you contract your muscle, these myosin molecules fire off in their millions, pulling along the actin filaments with millions of little tiny tugs. This collective effort all across your muscle is what causes the contraction. In all cells, actin filaments use the myosin motor proteins for motility. During cytokinesis, or cell division, 
Many actin filaments wrap around the cell like a belt. When the cell is ready to divide, the myosin allows the actin filaments to slide past one another, which tightens the belt, or like a rubber band around the middle of a water balloon, it squeezes tighter. This tightening ring of actin filaments will eventually pinch the cell membrane in half, producing two independent daughter cells. Actin is responsible for a different kind of cell motility. Groups of actin filaments can grow and bulge outwards, pushing out a lump in the side of the cell. These lumps that are gently extruding from the cell's membrane can actually be used to push the cell around, or to kind of walk around. A series of directed pushes by these actin lumps can make the cell crawl around and give it a degree of independent mobility. Recall how earlier I said that fibers in the cytoskeleton also move across the cell's internal space, through the cytoplasm to connect opposite sides of the cell? When actin filaments and myosin proteins crisscross the cell like this, they can influence the currents and the flow patterns of the cytoplasm. Each kick of the myosin is like a paddle. The flow of the cytoplasm is directed along the length of the actin filaments by the collective paddling of all of the myosin heads. So in this way, the specific orientation and placement of actin filaments can assist the directed transport of vesicles distributed by the Golgi complex. If the Golgi complex can send a vesicle of proteins along a known current in the cytoplasm to its target, that can help optimize the cell's functional effectiveness because you can move packages and stuff without having to spend all the energy to have a kinesin protein walk it out there. Alright, so that's about all that I want to cover for the cytoskeleton. The next substructure within the cell that I want to discuss is the endomembrane system. The endomembrane system, in a nutshell, is composed of the ER, the Golgi apparatus, and all of the transport vesicles they produce. And this overlaps with the cytoskeleton with all of the microtubules that are used to shuttle stuff around. So every part of the cell needs something different. Acid hydrolases and other proteins have to go to the lysosomes, where they sustain an internal pH around 4.5 to 5. Membrane proteins and phospholipids have to go and be installed into the cell's bilayer membrane. Catalases and other enzymes must go to the peroxisomes, where they break down long-chain fatty acids and reduce oxidizing radicals. The Golgi apparatus packages and sends all of the necessary parts to their proper location. But how does it do it? It turns out that when proteins are synthesized by ribosomes on the outside of the rough ER, they're given a chemical tag that directs them to enter the endoplasmic reticulum itself. This chemical tag binds to a small molecule called an SRP, or a signal recognition particle, which locks in place and halts further synthesis of the polypeptide chain. The SRP ribosome complex comes near the membrane, eventually coming into contact with the SRP receptor. When the SRP binds to the SRP receptor, the SRP breaks free from the complex and then floats away. Then the polypeptide chain continues to be synthesized, and the protein is squirted into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. So the SRP is kind of like a pause button for the ribosome. It halts the production of the protein until it can find an SRP receptor to hold onto the ribosome for it. After it hands off the ribosome, the SRP detaches and floats off to bind to another ribosome. And when it detaches, that's like somebody pushing the play button, and the protein continues synthesis. Inside the rough ER, in the lumen, these fresh polypeptide chains are folded properly into functional final shapes, with the assistance of a suite of chaperone proteins. Polypeptide chains, or proteins, entering the lumen of the rough ER come into association with numerous carbohydrates. When enzymes facilitate the binding of proteins and carbohydrates, they produce mixed glycoprotein molecules. The rough ER possibly uses these carbohydrates as tags to properly associate groups of proteins and to package them together into vesicles. These vesicles are sent to the cis side of the Golgi complex, where specific surface proteins on both the Golgi and the vesicle membranes allow them to link together and merge. The vesicle merging into the Golgi's membrane will deposit its contents into that first cis cisterna, and through the process of cisternal maturation, it's carried through the Golgi apparatus to the trans side. As the cisterna goes through stages of maturation and moves from cis to trans face, 
it exhibits different groups of enzymes. This continuous series of enzymes modifies the carbohydrate tags on the protein, like a vehicle assembly line carving up some piece of metal to eventually become a part in some automotive machinery. At the end of their enzymatic processing, the cisterna reaches maturation at the trans face of the Golgi apparatus. At this trans face, at the outer surface facing away from the nucleus, the cisterna will begin to break up into smaller globular vesicles. The proteins are sorted according to the specific chemical tags that they were given, and each tag corresponds to a specific location within the cell. So the proteins are sorted into regions of the trans face, and then grouped into vesicles according to their chemical tags, their destination. If you have a mannose sugar with a phosphate group bound to its sixth carbon atom, this acts as a chemical tag directing the protein to go to a lysosome. Two amino acid sequences, nine and three bases long, are chemical tags that direct the protein to a peroxisome. Other specific tags are used to direct proteins to the cell's plasma membrane, or to regions within the cytoplasm. Each tag is recognized by organelle-specific receptor pores, which allows the tagged protein to enter the organelle. The final substructure that I want to discuss is the nuclear pore complex, which connects the inside of the nuclear envelope with the rest of the cell. Now, as I've said before, the nuclear envelope holds the cell's genetic material. It holds the DNA of the organism. The nuclear envelope protects the DNA by keeping it deep in the heart of the cell, and it's double-wrapped with two lipid bilayers, so it's got four layers of phospholipids protecting it. The DNA inside of the nucleus is opened and transcribed by a large and complex suite of proteins. The DNA is used to produce RNA molecules, like the RNA used in the large and small subunits of ribosomes. When DNA gets read, it gets translated into an intermediate product called mRNA, or messenger RNA. This mRNA is the precursor to a protein, but first it has to leave the nucleus. The ribosomal RNA is squished between the two protein subunits of the ribosome, becoming integrated into their structure. The ribosomal subunits must also leave the nucleus along with the mRNA. So together, these large molecules are able to pass through very large structures called nuclear pores, which penetrate through both layers of the nuclear envelope. These pores also regulate what comes into the nucleus. Molecules produced outside the nucleus, like proteins required for transcription and DNA repair, or the nucleotide bases required for making DNA and RNA, are selectively allowed through the pores to the inside of the nucleus. But everything else is not allowed inside. This raises a question. How do these pores know to let in these particular molecules, but not others of similar size and polarity? The answers to this question, the details of the phenomenon, are being researched as we speak. But what is known is that proteins and other molecules produced outside the nucleus cannot enter the nucleus unless they have a particular chemical tag. This tag takes the form of a polypeptide chain composed of 17 amino acid monomers. All proteins bound for the nucleus, like the ones required for transcription and DNA repair, are given this chemical tag. As a result, the amino acid sequence composing this tag is called the Nuclear Localization Signal, or the NLS. The polypeptide chain is literally bound to the end of the finished protein, which gets recognized by other molecules within the cell, who then direct the protein to the nucleus. The nuclear pores recognize the NLS, and they undergo a conformation change to allow the tagged protein to come through. Similarly, an NES, or a nuclear export signal, is used to facilitate the transport of mRNA out of the nucleus. Unfortunately, not much is known about the inner mechanisms of the nuclear pores, but research is ongoing, and things are being learned every day. I think that's about all there is to the basics of the internal physiology of the cell. As the series goes on, I'll get into more detail on various things, like cellular respiration, cell cycle, enzymes, and metabolic pathways, and all that good stuff. So if you enjoyed this episode and you learned some cool stuff, and you want to hear more about cells and learn some more cool stuff, then stick around and check it out. And as always, thanks for listening.